All right, folks, uh, welcome everyone to SPC's Demo Fair, uh, the winter edition. Uh, before I get started, I just want to say that we are now planning on doing this a little more regularly, maybe every three or four months, given the amount of interest that we have seen from all of you. Uh, but thank you again for coming out. Um, we have an excellent roster of people presenting the latest and greatest from SPC. And we'll also have time afterwards for you to hang out and talk to the teams and just mingle. Um, a little bit about SPC, for those of you who uh, might not be super familiar. Um, SPC was started uh, seven years ago by Ruchi Sangvi. And the goal behind starting SPC was quite simple, which is that uh, it's too easy in Silicon Valley to basically be put on the treadmill of the next thing to do, right? Like you leave a big company or you should go and join an accelerator. And the goal behind SPC was that sometimes you just need some time and space to sit and think, to be able to figure out like what you want to work on before you actually start kind of like going and running like 100 miles an hour. Um, and a key part of that early stage exploration um, is actually building and hacking, right? Like our take is that ideas are cheap. Uh, you know, it's pretty easy to just sit out there and spew ideas. It's way more interesting to have that first line of code, that first pixel, maybe that first kind of like, you know, memo that you write. So a lot of our kind of like internal methodology and our internal like systems that we have center around like getting people to start building, to start hacking, to start exploring, to start tinkering. And the very act of building and hacking allows you to kind of like become more creative. So this is why you know, we kind of do these demo sessions uh, on a weekly basis here at SPC. And every you know, three or four months, we roll up some of the best ones. We get them out to the larger community. Um, one cool thing about the demo fair is that these are all live demos. Um, this is rare in Silicon Valley now, uh, but we insist on it. There might be a couple of slides here and there for help people to help show and give some context, but all of this shit is live. Um, as we all know from having done demos, the demo gods can be cruel. Um, they can be vindictive. Um, everybody has made their ritual offerings this morning, but they still might be cruel. Uh, so please be patient. Um, we're going to try to do this live. Um, and with this, the next slide, these are the people who will be entering the arena uh, momentarily. Uh, please applaud and cheer them. Uh, we are on your side. All right. Um, uh, first up, we have John from Gamma. All right. Hey, everyone. My name is John. I'm one of the founders of Gamma, and we are a new medium for presenting ideas beautifully using AI. So when I say presenting ideas, I mean like a slide presentation, but also other ways of presenting ideas, a written visual document or a web page. It's all powered by AI, so I can just give this any old topic to get started and make a presentation. Does anybody have a presentation they want to make that they've been dying for? Please. We haven't, yeah. We were talking yesterday. We have an SPC All Hands coming up next week. So Ruchi was actually like, well, I need to make a year in review kind of like slide there. And so can we make a 2023 year in review for SPC? Year in review. Let's see how it goes. So first things first, we'll get an outline. And we can take a look at this outline and see if it actually works for us. Um, we can also make a couple decisions, like do we want something more text heavy, maybe something briefer for a big all hands. We'll actually use AI generated images and we'll just kind of like stick with the style it gives us there. Uh, maybe you, anybody have anything they want the images to look like? Colorful, red, rainbow. What's SPC's vibe that we want here? <laughs> okay. Like the SPC vibe is very much like, you know, uh, Kind of like Patagonia, you know? OK, yeah, OK. And give me a color. What colors do we like? Um, brown and red. Brown and, and red. And green. Brown yeah. and red and green. OK, yeah. cool. See if Actually, I type no, no, no. Right. Just green. I like green. Oh, OK, right. we can do brown, red, and green. Oh, sorry, sorry. Too late. We're on brown, red, and green. We're going to generate a quick presentation right here, a year in review. So this may not be totally accurate for SBC. It doesn't actually know the details. We'll show how to pull those in later. But we're going to build up a real quick presentation here with various elements. So. 
see that was pretty fast. We've got some basic elements of company highlights. I think we also, I think we want a different look for this. Maybe if we want brown and red, something more like this would fit our vibe more. So we've got some basic elements here. We've got financial performance, product updates. Here's how our team did, community impact. And I'll just show you what this looks like if we were to actually go through and present this. So I can present this just like a slide deck. I can kind of step through these ideas one by one, emphasizing our company highlights. Uh, we'll talk about our profit margins for a while. Um, but maybe this isn't quite what I wanted. I want to tweak something. Uh, I feel like this isn't visual enough. So let's, yeah, this is actually a pretty good idea. Let's, um, let's make this a timeline, actually. Oh my god, one-handed typing. Let's see what we can do. So I can actually just chat with my slides and make changes I want to make. And now I've got this in a timeline, but I need more details. Say more on each thing. Let's see if it has any idea what I mean by that. Uh, thinking, thinking, hopefully it'll say more. All right, cool, so now I've got some details on this. Um, and once I'm ready and I have something I like, I can then go share this. So I can send it around as a document, a mobile-friendly doc. Uh, I can actually export it as a PDF or a PowerPoint, or what we're increasingly working on is publishing this as an entire site. So we can actually build a website out of this and put it online. I'll just share one simple example of what that looks like. This is a site made in Gamma, so following a very similar flow. But it's actually a whole site that people have built up kind of step by step through a workflow like this, uh, running on their real custom domain. Last thing I'll show is that was great for just taking a quick one line prompt. But what if I already have a lot of stuff I've already written up? Maybe I've already written up a doc version of my year in review. Uh, maybe I have an outline. Maybe I have long, detailed reports. Um, so I'll show you an example of just taking a strategy memo someone's already made. This is Mistral.ai strategy memo. If you haven't followed them, they're a French AI company. And I'm going to just copy this whole thing from a Google Doc directly into our advanced generator flow. So you'll see I've got a bunch of content in here. It's long and goes through a lot of details. I'm going to make a longer presentation here, and I want it to actually preserve my original text. And we'll just kick off one of these. This will take a little longer, but it's going to actually pull in my original source data, hopefully, about my oligopoly, about the power of European AI. Let's just make sure we actually know what our input content is for a second before we run this. Hopefully the demo gods will be kind to me. I don't know if I sacrificed enough pigeons or whatever. Here we go. So now it's going to pull in my actual source content and build an entire detailed presentation out of it, pulling in my original text and trying to maintain that original tone as much as possible. So in this case, I've asked for a detailed document, not just a presentation. So you'll notice that it's more wordy. And I'm getting AI images that actually map the vibe I went for in this case, which was sort of an AI green sort of effect that I wanted to go for. So we'll just kind of let this run, uh, generate stuff. And in the meantime, happy to take some questions. They just want to read. They just want to see the presentation. <laughs> Thanks, John. Are you um, thinking about ways to integrate with like Google Drive or sort of existing infrastructure to make it easier for the product to pull metadata from uh, files? Yeah, great question. We are already working on that. So we do have a basic import of Google Doc and Google Slides that we've built out. We think there's a much bigger opportunity here in plugging into a lot of other systems where your data already lives. Just give like one other example. Imagine you're a sales team and you have a CRM and you've got all your clients in there. Imagine if you could just press one click and say make a first pitch deck for that client or something like that. So we see integrations being a big part of our roadmap over the next year or so. Um, I think we might only have time for one question. Oh, yeah. okay, no worries. We can stop there. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, thank you, John. OK, up next, uh, we have Jia Chen and Ang Lee coming up to set up now. Uh, while they're coming up, I mean, this is the kind of stuff, you know, we hear so much about, obviously, election integrity and generally, like, you know, understanding how we can verify what we see online in the age of kind of like Gen AI and deep fakes. And this kind of stuff is just at the cutting edge of it. So super stoked for you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to thank SBC for building such a world-class community and everyone for joining and contributing. So hi, I'm JC, co-founder of Simula. We create AI on your personal device that perceives, 
reasons and takes action. Now, um, can people in the back of the room or on the side see my mouse? Yeah? I think I was sitting over there, so it was a bit hard to see, actually. So let's ask my agent to make it bigger for us. OK, so it's going to the system settings, finding the right place to click. And how does it look now? All right, better now? Awesome. OK, so it's unfortunate that my CEO and co-founder, Ang, isn't here today in person, because he's a remarkable person. And he can give you the whole grand vision about the company and agents on your computer. But uh, where is he? Hmm. Let me check if he's online. Oh, there we go. Hey, Ang wants to meet us on Google Meet right now, in the middle of a demo. OK, uh, let's get our agent to start a Google Meet for us. And we're going to do it on WhatsApp. OK, agent's asking for confirmation. Let's go ahead with it. So here, it's operating the browser, opening a Google Meet, waiting for the page to load, come on, clicking the link, crossing over to WhatsApp, finding the right person, um, and now entering the message for him. So good, hands free. OK, let's give it a moment for Ang um, to join us. Where's Ang? Um? Come on. Oh, OK, there we go. That's Mei Tang. Hey, Ang, how are you? Uh, I know you're busy, but why aren't you here? Yeah, so I'm at the airport right now. I'm flying to New Orleans for New Orleans. I guess you will be there next week. Uh, and yeah. uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, so how about we grab lunch together on Tuesday and uh, just discuss an important matter for the company? <laughs> oh, wait, right. actually, I just... I just came across a really nice restaurant in New Orleans. How about we meet there? Let me send you the, uh, the address there. Oh, uh, cool, sure, come on. Okay. Can Wait, you uh, make a calendar invite? It's an image. What am I supposed to do with an image? Okay, let's see if our agent can help us with this. So, our agent understands this context. That's uh at let's say eleven AM, okay. And it's asking asking for confirmation. Let's open the calendar and see what it's gonna do. Oops. Not that. Go ahead. And there we see the event on my calendar. Um, Ang, do you see this? Looks like the oh. address is correct. And yeah, it, that's cool. It just popped up on my phone right now uh, yeah. in my calendar. That was fast. Even All got right, the time so, zone uh, correct. Yeah. All right, so let's get back to the demo. And it seems many investors are looking at us right now. So hmm. what about we reach out to two of them um, on LinkedIn through cold messages? Let's, um, let's not just, yeah, let's not just send in templates, all right? So, because uh, we want to be polite. Hmm. Um, yeah, also, uh, one thing is uh, LinkedIn doesn't allow messages from strangers sometimes. What can we do with that? Hmm, I think um, we have to maybe ask a mutual connection, and the people at SBC are all so well connected. So uh, let's just select a few people from this list of people here. There we go. Hmm, let's see what it's gonna do. Here's our lucky people, okay? <laughs> Lisa and Reed. Um, Reed is probably not in the room today. He's gonna come into SVC next week, but let's uh, message them anyhow, okay? And if we can't do it, how about that? Okay, we have the right people, Lisa and Reed. Let's go ahead. And here, our agent's going back to the browser. Okay, opening a new tab, going to LinkedIn, clicking on the search box, finding Lisa. Okay. 
And just to make sure, it's going to find the people button. And you can see that it's doing uh, its reasoning on the left-hand side, so it's clicking Lisa. And on this page, it's understanding every pixel to understand Lisa's profile and craft a personalized message. So luckily, we can message Lisa. There's a message button right there. Okay, uh, LinkedIn's giving us a free message, so sure, let's, why not use it? Okay, <laughs> all right. Okay, hey Lisa, yep, okay, there we go. And, yeah, okay, interesting. Let's send it. <laughs> awesome, <laughs> great. Okay, don't forget, we have a, a next person. So now it's going to the search box again. Oh, oh wow. Okay, live, live demo, live demo. Let's see. Okay, what is it gonna do now, okay? <laughs> going to read. Okay, uh, unfortunately, we cannot message read. So, what are we gonna do? Going to mutual connections and Evan. Okay, so here, actually, I'm gonna minimize that, right? Uh, we only have Evan on the page, so it's gonna choose Evan, of course, right? Clicking on message, and there we go, okay. Uh, quite a long message asking for connecting with Reed. And. <laughs> okay, come on. It's a casual message. We know Evan. Evan's our quarterback. Okay. Awesome. So, and then we're done. Mission complete. All right. Now, to sum it up, to make such a general agent possible, we need pretty much everything in machine learning. We need multimodal perception that's language, vision, and even audio, all powered by deep learning. So, to get the agent to do actions, we need planning and decision making, uh, even reinforcement learning. And to get it to interact with the real world, we need language output using LLMs. We need the agent to use tools, use APIs. And of course, even low level computer actions at the operating system level, which is mouse and keyboard movements, which you just saw. We want to make this agent available to everyone. So, please sign up for our beta test program. And thank you. Oh, awesome. Thanks, Evan. Yeah, make the connection for us. Yeah. Uh, we're going to do questions for uh, Jeffin uh, after. Okay, I have a feeling that uh, a bunch of you are probably going to have questions. Um, okay. I'll just say that, you know, I don't say this very often, but every once in a while you actually see the future in front of you. And if you don't walk away from that thinking that this is actually our relationship to how we use our primary essentially like devices, whether it be our computers or whether it be our phones, are going to be radically different in two years. Um, I don't know, you know, this is just incredible. Uh, good job, good job up there. That's that a amazing. high praise. <laughs> yeah, we'll live up to it. Incredible. Um, I mean, some of that stuff was, I mean, you actually have to do that in real time across all of those different surfaces and the multimodal stuff, I mean, between the foundation models, the planning, very cool. Um, okay, uh, awesome. All right, up next, Chris and Stefan. Hello. All right, hi everyone, I'm Chris. I'm Stefan. And we're building the future of entertainment at JARS AI. So right now, a lot of entertainment is one way. I'm talking about it's 2 a.m., you're laying in bed, just scrolling endlessly on TikTok, you're watching hours of YouTube videos passively. But what if your entertainment was two-way? What if it responded to your input um, and your interests, uh, both of you and your friends, in real time? We're building that future at JARS AI. So it's a new medium of entertainment that's in between TV and interactive game where social chat prompts are turned into entire two to three minute episodes all in real time. Um, so I'll talk to an example to make that more concrete here. So we have one channel, which is Jars Court. Um, it's based off of Judge Judy. So you can submit a prompt, which is a court case. Um, and then two AI characters will make their case to the judge um, all over the course of a two to three minute episode. So I'll pull that up now. I'll zoom in on chat here real quick. Um, so I'm a fan of Harry Potter, so I'll just kind of say, what if I wanted to know what um, Voldemort sues his plastic surgeon? Everybody's been wondering that. <laughs> um, so that's added to the topic of the top of the topic queue. Um, and then on screen here, you can see this is the courtroom. Um, and then, uh, let me actually take this on. Yeah. So this is the courtroom where these characters are presenting their case to the judge. And then we have an overlay here uh, where the topic being litigated 
is shown across the bottom as well as the captions. Um, and then on the top left, we have some, some like gamification features. Uh, so I'll take this off mute really quick. Voldemort sues his plastic surgeon for negligence, claiming that his new nose is not evil enough and fails to strike fear into the hearts of wizards and muggles alike. Did that guy just complain about his new nose? So we need to figure out if the surgeon messed up and made it less evil. Hey, Voldemort, tell us how this negligence affected the evilness of your nose specifically. My new nose is a disgrace. It lacks the menacing presence I require to strike fear into the hearts of all. The surgeon's negligence has left me disfigured and powerless. Plastic surgeon, can you explain the specific procedures you performed on Voldemort's nose and how you ensured its evilness? Your Honor, I meticulously crafted Voldemort's new nose with the utmost precision and attention to detail. I used the finest materials and infused it with a touch of dark magic to enhance its evilness. All right, so I'll put it on mute there because that'll go on for another few minutes. Um, <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> this, um, so all of our channels follow this same general premise. You submit a very low fidelity prompt. Like you, know, you saw that was just like six words and that turns into a three minute episode um, fully happening in real time in this 3D world. Um, so we have a few different channels. So this one is like a court case one. Um, and then I'll hand it over to Stefan and we'll talk about some of our other channels really quick. All right, let's dive in. First up, we have Love Island, the world's first AI dating show. Um, and so here, five AI agents are budding for the heart of another AI agent named Serena. Um, and, you know, we can see what they're, they're talking about here. Okay, they, oh, she decided to give the rose to herself. And so these are all user generated. <laughs> You know, I, I love that. Uh, so empowering. And okay. And <laughs> next up, we have uh, <laughs> pawn jars. And so, in this way, uh, in this show, you will submit a item for sale, and then a backstory is created around this item. And then two AI agents are going to go back and forth about the price of this item. Um, and then, so we have a couple other shows. Um, so we have a fortune teller, and we also have a uh, nature documentary as well. And so, um, yeah, all of these following the same kind of uh, template where you will submit a prompt and it'll turn into in its own episode. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's what we have so far in terms of the in-house channels. Um, you know, the last couple months, what we've been really impressed by is our power users coming back day after day for hours at a time, um, riffing with each other, riffing with friends and, and just strangers as well. And what we've seen is they've gotten really good at making these prompts and there's this kind of magic of co-creation that's happening. Um, and so, concretely, what that has been, uh, what we've seen is 40% week over week growth of user generated episodes. So, we're really stoked on that. Um, the next step for us is migrating to our own platform. Right now, all the channels are hosted on Twitch, but there are like limitations with Twitch, TikTok, and all these other existing platforms where they don't serve this sort of new architecture of AI generated storytelling. And so, that's what we want to enable on our own platform on jars.ai. Um, and then the second thing I'll just go over is right now all of our creators are prompters. And so it's people thinking of the most clever and unique and funny episode that they can. Um, but really there's another level we want to enable. If we want anyone to be able to create their own AI world as we have done here in these six channels. And uh, yeah. Awesome. Um, sweet. So yeah, Stefan and I are very excited to be building this company and you know, be building in this space. Um, so and hopefully you all are excited about the space as well. Um, we wanted to kind of end with two asks for the audience. Uh, first one is we are hiring. Um, we're looking for engineers and designers. So if you or anyone you know is really excited about pushing the boundaries of what entertainment in the future looks like, please scan the QR code or reach out to us um, after this demo fair. Um, and the second ask is, as you saw through our demos, everything is currently live on jars.ai. Um, we invite all of you to hop on tonight, submit some prompts, and yeah, we'd love to see you there. Thanks for your time, everyone. Who might not know, we actually um, opened SPC New York about, yeah, it kind of officially opened about a year ago. Um, like with many things, SPC, it kind of started somewhat organically uh, when during the pandemic, uh, a number of our uh, members and alumni left our incredible city of San Francisco, uh, you know, what were they thinking, and decided to go to New York. And uh, about 18 months into the pandemic, we kind of ended up getting a, an incredible kernel of like 30 to 40 people who all were affiliated with SPC, but more importantly, just wanted to continue figuring out what is, you know, like we just want the negative one to zero kind of like ideation journey and community out on, in New York. 
So um, we decided to take that initial, I would say, community and make it into a thing. Much like, you know, happened in San Francisco where basically Ruchi ended up just getting the space to kind of create a physical space for people to uh, congregate. We did the same in, uh, in New York. We have a place in NoHo, uh, I'm told. No, it's NoHo. Um, and then now, lo and behold, we have close to 100 members, uh, active members in SPC New York. And it's been an incredible source of like new energy, new members, ideas. new ideas, new demos, and new companies. So actually, the next, uh, well, technically, the next two, uh, the next two companies that are uh, products that are coming up are going to be are actually out of SPC New York. So up first, we have Abil, uh, who's building Commune, uh, and he should be popping up maybe. Boom. Am I on? Magic. Hell yeah. All right. Um, okay. All right, Abil, over to you, man. You got the show. Thank you, Aditya. And thanks again to the SPC team for having us. So, hi, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here. My name is Abiel. Uh, my co-founder, Andres, is also, also on the call. We're the founders of Comun, the neobank for Latino immigrant families. So before demoing the product to you, I want to walk you through what an immigrant goes through when trying to open a bank account in the U.S. for the first time. Some of you might relate. So if I go to chase.com slash espanol, as you can see in the URL, more than half of the landing page is in English. Even if I decide to proceed, I get an alert saying the application flow and any document related to any product is only going to be in English. So then if I try Bank of America, Spanish landing page, I get the same issue. If I still decide to proceed, Maybe I do have an SSN. I personally have had one since 2014 when I got my first job as an intern. But even then, the fact that I'm not a citizen means I can't open an account online. I've been legally in the States for nine years. Imagine how high the bar is for an immigrant that just arrived, not all of which might be here uh, with documents, right? So that's a problem that we want to solve with Comun. Let me now share my iPhone screen. So what we did with Comun is we want to solve primarily three access problems for immigrants to open a bank account. A big reason behind being able to do this is that we connect directly to our partner bank. We started with banking as a service and we've since migrated and we own our own compliance in-house. So you can see the Spanish interface already. You put in your name, you put in your date of birth, and this is where we solve the second access problem. If you don't have a social security number, you can use a foreign ID. You can choose from more than 100 IDs in Latin America. No other bank offers this. And a big reason is that we own our fraud infrastructure and compliance. So I could choose my Mexican passport. Here's my picture here. I can use my work visa. I can use my US tourist visa, or I want to give this a challenge. I'm going to use my Mexican voter ID that I got issued 10 years ago. So we're really testing the system here. So we take a picture. We're actually taking two pictures, one with a flash and one without, and that helps recognize whether this is a fraudulent session. The automatic barcode scanner also helps with that. Lastly, I need to take a selfie. This helps match identity, but also is a liveness check. So now we're going to submit this. We need to give it a moment. There we go. Now, the third piece that we're solving is address verification. Every bank will ask you for an official document that has your name and your address. Immigrants tend to not have utility bills because they come to live with friends, relatives, and nothing is under their name. So this is a big area where there's a ton of drop off in most banks as well. So I'm going to put my own address. And address verification for us is simply using geolocation. Now, we use software to determine whether or not you're using a VPN. There's a fingerprinting happening on the device. And we're also inspecting whether this is a simulator or an actual device. 
And this is how we get bank approval to be able to do this. So this is the last step. I submit this, and this is my application. Immigrants can get an account in five minutes from their cell phones in their house. The other thing that I wanna share with you guys is, this is our live instance of our fraud system. We're looking at 65 flags that combine the explicit inputs of our users, but also implicit activity from the session. Again, including device behavior, any traces in the web from your PII, and the way you're interacting with your device. And so the last thing I wanna show, if I go back to my phone. Now, this is a production application. A big ethos of us is we want to get our users away from brick and mortar predatory services. A lot of our immigrants get paid in checks here with Comun from the comfort of your house and your mobile device. We have 2FA for security. You can deposit a check. Here you take a picture. You no longer have to go to a brick and mortar store that is gonna take several percentage points from the value of your money. And the last thing that is very cool, we recent, again, we recently integrated to a new partner bank. Given that we own our own infrastructure, I can change in this internal version of our app to our new bank partner in less than a second. If you look at my new balance, 1,000 instead of 100. So from here, something that immigrants really appreciate is instant payments to their loved ones. I'm gonna grab Andres, my co-founder. I'm gonna ask for $1. This is a request. Andres, let's see if he can accept it. This is all about speed and ease. Instead of having to go uh, to Western Union for and purchase a money or order, basically. And there we go, Andres just approved it. So again, um, this is Comun. Uh, we're making, we're helping immigrants turn their hard work into uh, upwards mobility through banking. Um, Thank you, everyone, for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Questions? People just want to see the cool stuff, I think. Um, OK, Abil, thank you for the time. Uh, I will say that. You know, I've been in this country now. I got here when I was 18. And since then, I had an F1 visa, OPT, CPT, H1B, EB3 green card, EB1 green card, uh, followed by now to be a proud citizen of this country. But man, there was like, you know, lots of trips to the local bank early on. And it was like pretty fucking painful. So I'm glad you're building this. Uh, thank you for doing this. Uh, round of applause for Abil, please. <laughs> Thank you again. All right, uh, we're going to take you off the screen. And up next, Amit, while he's getting set up, you know, it's, it's not easy to demo what these guys just did because they're really demoing that, like, hey, you can do a lot of shit with, like, two lines of code, right? Like, that's actually not an easy demo to pull off. Uh, so well done, guys. Um, amazing. I mean, w one of the things that's kind of wild about the world we live in today is simply, I would say, the the panoply of kind of like foundation models, the ways to access them, the different price curve, the different clouds you can go to. Um, and I think just being able to simplify that down into like, you know, like one kind of API call that you know is guaranteed to be performant, cheap, reliable, I think is actually like a huge unlock. So stoked for you guys. And up next, we have Amit Jain. All right, welcome. Should I use the mic? Oh. Uh, yeah, you should use the mic, please. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Aditya. Uh, hey everyone, my name is Amit. Um, I'm, I'm from Luma AI. I'm one of the co-founders and the CEO. Um, very briefly, what we're working on is uh, we want to make visual AI, especially we want to make foundation models that can see and that can show um, uh, you know, what's in our mind's eye, basically. So uh, there's a specific angle that we have, which is that like, you know, it's not for particularly creativity, but rather it's, it's for exploration. It's for thinking about, um, you know, uh, not everyone is creative or, or wants to be, or, or like, you know, um, 
ha has this motivation to share or, or have a big audience to share with. But pretty much every one of us um, thinks or you know, functions in some visual medium, some visual things. So as a team, we're building that. But like, you know, put all that aside, I want to show you what you're seeing here. So this is our first um, fully feed-forward 3D diffusion model that is in Discord, and a lot of people are using it. I don't know uh, what kind of prompts will show up here because it's Discord, and it's very wild. Um, <laughs> there's some uh, LLM filtering of, of, of the prompt, but you know, it's not perfect. So what you're seeing here is a model that is able to generate um, fully 3D consistent uh, multi-view objects. Uh, so this is actually a video diffusion model that understands 3D. Uh, this is our research preview, and, and we, we built this to learn about how to make diffusion models that don't just operate on sequence of images and, and see the world as sequence of images, but rather see the world as how humans do, how, how to move around and things like that. So uh, these are fully view consistent objects. Someone generated, okay, a knitted hamburger. Um, uh, sure. Uh, so, you know, you can check them out, and uh, sure, this one. So these are fully 3D consistent objects. Uh, this is currently a bit low resolution because it's only a 3.2 billion parameter model, um, but we're gonna scale it up to, uh, you know, 11 billion or so um, December 12th. But the purpose of this model is to show to ourselves that it is possible to build new architectures of diffusion models that can, um, you know, work in 3D. So yeah, this is Genie. Um, you can try it in Discord. Um, uh, we launched it about two weeks ago. Uh, there's some 100,000 of people are trying it at this moment. Um, but yeah, it just works like this. Uh, it's a fully diffusion model, so you can try various different combinations, uh, you know, different things that can be done with it. Um, it also understands language slightly at the moment because it's very small. So you know, there's not much language understanding. It is able to do some compositions, but not much. Um, so okay, why are we doing this besides like you know learning? Um, the other part is um, when we started. Actually, we launched this today. I might show you. Um, so when we started, we had a slightly different mission. We wanted to let people show what they see, um, you know, to other people. And and I remember, uh, you know, talking to Aditya and, and the SPC team like upstairs over there. Um, or was it in the previous office? I, I don't know anymore. But this is, uh, you know, kind of kind of an approach where these are fully photorealistic 3D walls. So this is the other side of it. This is for capture. And it allows people to you know, bring these to any websites and do all kinds of VFX effects um, that was only ever possible before at like ILM or Pixar level because it, it needed that much effort to make some things these photorealistic. These are captured with iPhones, by the way. And um, you know, now you can do literally um, anything you can imagine. Uh, these are like custom shaders, things like that. These all seem, might seem like a little bit disconnected things at the moment, but the end result that, that we are working towards is it's a tool that, that, that will allow people to think visually, to, to like, you know, pull ideas out of their minds that are, um, that are not necessarily images or, or uh, you know, audio alone, but they're just like fully formed things or, or unformed things, bash them together without needing to go through a long production process or without like, completely collapsing that idea into the one stream because you can't only afford to explore that one stream. Um, that, that's kind of where we'll take it. Um, I think that's all I have to show. Um, uh, just some, some stuff on that. Like when we, re we released this app about um, 11 months ago and now we have about 2 million users who are capturing, showing their memories to each other. Um, it's freely available, um, but it also gives us an immense amount of 3D data that mostly no one in the industry can actually, uh, or no one in the industry has. Uh, so you know, when you're thinking about, hey, can I train a model in 3D, and can I teach it that the world actually is spatial, um, you can want to do that, but you won't be able to do that because the, you don't have data. So um, this turned out to be honestly a nice coincidence. Um, I would like to say, like you know, it was well designed. Um, we had some intention, but you know. Uh, it's cool. Um, other than that, so uh, as a team, we are uh, 23, uh, 24 people as of this. Someone just accepted in that office. So 24 people. And um, 
Um, we are half engineers, half researchers. Um, on research side, we have people who, like, you know, uh, an author of Diffusion Models, Jaming Song, uh, author of Nerf Neural Rendering, Matt Hansik, my co-founder, Alex, from UC Berkeley. We have a lot of Berkeley people. And um, on engineering and design side, we have, we have my, some of my friends from Apple and, and, and some really good engineers, like from PyTorch team, stuff like that. Uh, we have many open roles. If you're a good engineer um, and you want to learn ML, if, you're a, uh, if you want to work on products and UIs, we, we're not a model company. Yes, we're going to make models, but our belief is that like, people who want to make good software have to make their own models. Um, it's like hardware at this point. Um, so we care deeply about the products that we make, about how people will use them, and what they will unlock for people. So if you want to work on products, if you want to work on UIs, if you want to work on front end, um, or just want to work on training models that train on five petabytes of data and, and just enjoy that challenge, come reach out to us or anyone at SPC. Uh, you know, uh, um, they know us really well. Uh, but yeah, I would love to hear from you. So, but that's it. Any questions for me? All right, find him after. Um, all right, up next. So up next, so we only have two more demos. Uh, up next, we have Pascal from Uon Space. Uh, this is one. Uh, this one is a little new for us. This is our first ever hardware demo, um, but they're building stuff that goes into space. So that's pretty fucking cool. Um, so we can have AI and space in the, in the same two hours. Life is incredible, folks. We live in crazy times. Um, okay, you're up next, Pascal. Um, all right, uh, my name is Pascal Stang. I'm a, a founder of um, um, Yuan Space, and I uh, want to start by saying I hate to break it to you. I'm not going to talk about AI, but I, we do use AI at the company, and it's a very important technology. And um, I'm personally pretty thrilled about AI's potential, and I really love what I've seen here today so far. Um, hope to talk to some people afterward. Uh, I'm going to talk instead about um, a little bit about Muon's mission and something that we're doing. Um, Muon Space is a company that uh, uh, is focused on um, doing Earth observation uh, and accessible planetary intelligence. And by that, I mean uh, gathering data from space about the Earth, uh, mostly about climate change, about natural resources, uh, about um, extreme weather, and uh, crunching that into insights for our customers and for humanity to better adapt and, um, and mitigate climate change. Uh, it's a lofty mission. We have a lot of work to do. And one of the things I want to talk to you about today is um, one of our specific missions that we're working on, which is uh, a fire detection and tracking mission. Uh, the, uh, the goal here, as you can see, we, uh, we aim to, uh, in areas that are particularly vulnerable in the world, uh, be able to image and detect um, a five by five meter fire, so a very small scale starting wildfire, and be able to do that um, and detect it and report it within 20 minutes from virtually anywhere on Earth. Um, I think uh, for those of you that are California natives or California um, residents, I don't have to remind you that um, even in places like, uh, like just the state of California, uh, wildfire causes tens of billions of dollars worth of damage each year. And uh, the ability to mitigate that and uh, the loss of life is a super big problem. It's only going to get worse from here. Let me uh, bump forward a little bit. I want to move this through this quickly. So um, I'm, uh, I'm doing a hardware demo today. Uh, in muon terms, uh, risky is spicy. Fortunately, that's OK. I like spicy. I like Thai hot. Um, <laughs> so demo seems to be working right now. I'm going to talk to you about how it works. And then um, we're going to um, show some imagery out of the sensor, actually. So here what you see is you see um, five different bands of infrared uh, imagery. Um, this is simulated, as it would be seen by our instrument from a satellite. And you can kind of see in the visible range, there's a lot of obfuscation via um, cloud cover, things like that, smoke from a fire. But you get into the longer wave infrared, you're able to actually see where the fire is, where the boundary is. Um, this is super important to assessing damage potential, um, firefighting, and um, uh, really tracking the perimeter of the fire. So this is one of the things our instrument is, is uh, able to do. And what's really important about this is we need to be able to cover a lot of the Earth really, really fast. So uh, in order to do that, we've got to image with a high-resolution thermal sensor and scan it as we go. Imagine like a satellite flying over the Earth. We scan the sensor, collect a 5,000-kilometer swath um, of data as it flies, 
and we go around the Earth slightly a different place each time we go and uh, collect the entire Earth um, and uh, downlinking uh, you know, several times during the orbit. We've got a couple different cameras involved. Here I'm only going to show you one. And uh, let me see if I can land. Oh, my apologies. I'm out of order on the slides. I'm going to stay on this slide, ditch the slideware for a moment. We're going to unplug, um, go over to that machine over there, and see if we can see some uh, of this uh, imagery for you live. Let's see if it works. All right, well, we also have another saying at Muon, which is, if you want it to work the first time, don't make it the first time. Um, we'll have to deal with the small screen. Uh, for those of you who want to come up later. OK, great. Oh, I see. Thank you. Um, let me take a quick moment to describe to you what's going on here. Uh, we've got a scanning mirror. It's moving back and forth. It's, um, uh, oh, in the commotion, I forgot to do something important. Take off the lens cover. <laughs> Classic blunder. Um, what you see here, a little bit small, is um, uh, this instrument scanning the audience. And uh, all of you humans show up kind of warm. It's good. You're alive. Uh, the background's dark, brick is dark. Uh, this is a thermal imaging camera, and um, it's actually got a cryo cooler up top to keep the sensor super cool so it can see the infrared rays coming off of the environment. Um, and then this scanning mirror is a prototype of the one that we're going to launch in about a year from now. It'll be on orbit. Um, it's not super visible right now, but if you want to come up later and, and touch it, you can tell that this, can this um, scanning mirror isn't actually moving smoothly. It's very, very rapidly stepping to a new location letting the camera take a picture, and then moving rapidly again to the location, it's taking a picture again, and doing that um, about 82 times per, per scan in order to assemble that uh, array image I was looking at uh, with you on the slides. Um, yeah, let's see. Uh, so I think I covered that um, uh, this is a, a demo example. Uh, it's getting worked on right now, um, going up uh, in Q1 2025 on one of our satellites. And um, uh, we're super thrilled to see the potential of this, uh, this technology and what we can do for, uh, for fire detection. Maybe I'll wrap it there, uh, see if there's any questions. If you're fighting a fire today, what is the general latency of the information that you have? Like, are there drones? Like, I mean, how do you get the info today? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, there are technologies available today. Uh, even California has, um, has drones, has aircraft that they deploy. Uh, these are potent tools that are able to be used, but they're only spot checks, right? You can't um, send these things to go do detections. It's not efficient. You'd be flying for, for days and days, um, burning a lot of natural, fuel, natural um, uh, fossil fuels uh, just to try to do a detection. And so I think this is where our particular instrument really leads. Um, we want to catch the fire really early before it grows very big while it's still very containable. And that means that detection is the biggest problem. Um, after that, we do uh, perimeter tracking for, for firefighting. I think I saw someone else had a question. Uh, what's the approximate launch cost for uh, getting this into space, if you don't mind sharing? That's a great question. Um, Launching things into space isn't cheap, and developing technology for space isn't cheap. However, uh, SpaceX has changed the game as far as launch. And our particular approach to technology really focuses on using commercial uh, equipment that's been well tested for the space environment. So all in all, a mission like this per satellite is on the order of single digit millions of dollars per satellite. And um, in order to get the kind of coverage that we want to have, we have to launch a constellation of them. But even as few as, as um, three or four satellites start to make a dent, as you launch more, you um, get a faster notification time. All right, folks, uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hall. Thank you very much. Pascal, you will forever be known as the first ever hardware demo at a demo fair. All right, and to wrap up here, uh, we have uh, the Revelation Health uh, team, uh, Amit, Guy, and Vinayak, uh, talking to us about the future of uh, personalized healthcare. Uh, thank I just want to start by thanking SPC. The support we have received in the last three months is just astonishing. So thank you very much, guys. Um, we are Revelation Health. We are three co-founders, Guy, uh, Vinayak, and myself. 
60% of adult Americans have chronic disease. And that proportion is growing as we live longer. That means most people will face chronic illness in their lifetime. Cancer, diabetes, heart disease. To make matters worse, access to doctors is also getting harder, right? Uh, there is a shortage of doctors, nurses, and that gap is not only enormous, but it's getting bigger every day. What does a person need in order to face a chronic illness, to navigate through, a, through the journey of a disease? Knowledge, support, empathy, empowerment. That's why we created Nadia a personal AI health companion. Let's dive into the demo. Every day, there are 1 billion health-related searches on Google alone. Online tools like Google, WebMD, or ChatGPT don't really have your personal memory, uh, personal medical history. Neither do they remember how you felt last week. Nadia does. In this demo, you will witness our patient, Ryan, chatting with Nadia. Ryan has MS, multiple sclerosis, an autoimmune disease that causes long-term damage to the nervous system. Nadia has already, yeah, Nadia has observed a drop in Ryan's physical activity in the past few days. She initiates today's conversation with a proactive inquiry. Through seamless parsing of patients' medical records, Nadia knows your health history, and that's a big distinguishing factor. Nadia learns from every interaction with Ryan. She tracks health measures over time using disease-specific standard methods. So as, as she's tracking, yeah. And, one more thing I want to point out is Nadia is connected to, not just to Ryan's medical history, but to his circle of care. This includes providers like Ryan's neurologist, as well as caregivers such as Ryan's daughter, Mira. You will see those interactions. She just uh, sent a message to the neurologist. Now, she hopefully will contact the caregiver, Mira. This feature will appeal to millions of adult children who are in the position to, you know, position of caring for their grown up, uh, for their parents, whether directly or from a distance. Notice the text just came <laughs> to Mira. Uh, they want to be informed and kept in the loop on care decisions before an urgent situation arises. Nadia is engineered to have short, medium, and long term memory and to reason over that memory just like humans do. So now, I guess uh, Ryan is asking, uh, hey, can I do Tai Chi? Because my uh, daughter suggested it. Let's see what, uh, yeah. So, so Nadia is responsive not only to the health history, but also as a whole, to the holistic health. So notice here she has been able to go pull a publication which supports that uh, Tai Chi will, can help in uh, relieving MS symptoms. So, uh, that's, that's the holistic side of things. Another thing is because Nadia knows what medication Ryan is already taking, she can do drug-drug interaction. So she can be aware that, oh, you are taking these medications and if you take a new medication, what the impact might be. So in this case, she's noticing she, uh, Ryan shouldn't take aspirin, which might look like a common sense. Uh, that anybody can take aspirin, but Ryan is actually on an anticoagulant for his knee surgery. And so, you know, they do interact negatively. So she's sub, uh, suggesting ibuprofen instead. At the same time, you know, even though she's taking those, mentioning this drug-drug interaction, at the same time, only doctors and uh, licensed health healthcare providers can, um, can legally give medical advice. And Nadia knows not to overstep those bounds. It's reflected in the, actually in the first three letters of her name, N-A-D, not a doctor. <laughs> um, so uh, let's, so that was the chat part of the demo. 
Uh, we'll take questions later, but let's let's move on to the health measures. Okay. So Nadia is tracking health measures for for Ryan. You know there are three typical ones for uh, MS, uh, which is numbness, pins and needles, and fatigue. But you can also track custom features, like uh, in this case, Ryan has chosen to track his daily push-ups. It could be minutes of meditation or ounces of water drunk, you know. Uh, and notice, uh, you know, when you look at the numbness, the, what Nadia had observed is really true. There was no numbness, and then there is a small but consistent increase in numbness, which is why she reached out to the neurologist. Through the add medical records feature, we have made it painless to feed Nadia your exhaustive medical history. We think it's a key differentiator uh, of our product in our cognition engine's ability to obtain and structure the medical records. You know, it's a big pain point to get the medical records, structure them, put them in one place, and we have made that painless. From there, your personal journey is charted chronologically into a vertical timeline, as you see here, and the timeline can be both searched and filtered. With that, I would like to uh, end on a somber note. Uh, Amit and I um, lost our Amit and I lost our father 12 years ago um, to a sudden heart attack. Uh, it felt like a, a sudden event, but there were a lot of preceding events that, if you look back and see, this you know we could have we could have saved him, um, and we wished if if something like Nadia was available for him, which could track his measures, which could uh, proactively engage him, make sure he's taking his medications, uh, and also uh, involve the support circle as needed, or alert as things go south, um, he would have been alive today. And uh, you know, we would have, he'd probably been in the audience, or he could have seen my son become seven today, uh, or, or Amit's son uh, become 13 this month. Uh, so I think, that's one of our driving principles behind Nadia, a, a health companion that can bridge that gap. Um, if you or your loved one uh, wants to uh, use Nadia, uh, we have a health list, uh, we have a wait list at um, revelation.health um, slash wait list. Thank you. Any questions for Amit? So, so even though um, the medication it suggests may or may not be, you know, it's not medical advice, someone may still take it, even though it says my, it may help with uh, ibuprofen. How do you, uh, like, people may not know that the other end. They might just be like, oh, yeah, this, this is going to help. So how are you going to prevent someone from actually doing something? Because there's no statistical thing telling you, like, it may or may not. Because some of the things are cited with uh, medical research, but others are not. So if it may or may not, what does that mean to other people who may not understand that, you know, co context. Well, I mean, that's, that's an excellent question. I mean, that's a tight line that we are trying to walk. And I think we have reached a very good compromise. So the, the idea there is we don't want Nadia to be so conservative <laughs> that she doesn't suggest anything. And every, for every question, go, says, go see, see your healthcare provider. And at the same time, we want to give them personal information. So there is some balance that we are trying to achieve and making the user aware of it. Also, they can sort of um, you know, customize the level of risk they want to take so that they are personally standing what, where are they drawing that line. And they are acknowledging where they are drawing, drawing that line. So somebody could be very conservative and somebody could be more risk averse or the other way. Um, are there certain diseases that it's more tailored to? Because, like, I have a family member who had a stroke. Like, are the models trained currently for certain diseases, but, like, as more data comes in, they'll be better suited for others? And then also, just with my knowledge of the healthcare system, for example, like, UCSF is on Epic, and Athena Health is, like, a completely different system, and I know it's super hard to integrate. Like, how are you guys dealing with those integrations? Yeah, those are great questions. Maybe I'll take the, the second one first. 
So getting access to medical records directly from the provider can be a pain. Um, but one of the things that's working very much in our favor and the patient's favor is now providers have this legal obligation to make records available to patients upon request within 30 days at no charge. So that's kind of like the first line. The patients themselves can ask for the records and they can upload them. As was briefly shown, what we really want to get to is uh, they don't have to go and interact with the provider at all, but instead they can leverage an existing interface that pulls the data automatically. Apple is kind of a leader in this space where they already have interfaces to a bunch of, a bunch of providers. Um, your first question about specializing, we are doing that in the short term because we think there are certain um, user populations for whom this will be especially valuable. In, in the broad sense, it's what I mentioned, which is chronic disease patients. Right? These are patients who they, they deal with disease every day. Um, they don't need to be in the hospital. right? If that was the case, they shouldn't be using a, an AI health companion. But they have an ongoing need for information and support. So we think um, autoimmunity is a really good area for us to start helping people and focus on their needs. But our goal is definitely to be as broad and general as possible. Thank you, guys. Thank you for bringing us home. And thank you to all of the presenters. You guys crushed it. And thank you all again for coming. Enjoy the rest of your day.